chapter that we're going to do January 7th. Our service is outlined on that folder. Uh, use it as a bookmark. This morning we follow Divine Service 72, page 167. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, our sins to God our Father, most oh, merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence. mercy has given his only son to die for you and for his sake forgive you all of your sins. As they called and ordained, certainly the word I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro Pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the community of all, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
May all who are baptized in his name faithful in your calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the word of the Lord. We can't grab it together, friend. Yesterday was a special day. 
blood of you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is the Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 1, which was read earlier. The sermon notes are in your bulletin if you wish to use them to help you follow along. Well, today is the first Sunday after the Epiphany, which was celebrated yesterday with little or no fanfare. Epiphany is one of those holidays that unfortunately gets little attention. In my cynicism, I would suggest it gets little attention or no fanfare because it's not a very sellable holiday. After all, what do you sell to celebrate Epiphany? But having said that, as I mentioned in Bible class this morning, uh, there is the King's Cake uh, that is sold uh, on King's Day. And in the King's Cake is uh, cooked a baby Jesus. And when you find that baby Jesus in your piece of cake, then you are the one who gets to host the presentation of Jesus' celebration on February the 2nd. So I guess there is something to be celebrated for Epiphany. But for us Christians... Epiphany always has been a special holy day. For many years, Epiphany has been known as the Gentile Christmas because it is the first appearing of the Savior of the world to Gentiles, to non-Jewish people. Epiphany is an important holiday, and no matter how little fanfare it receives, because it is the day we Gentile Christians are reminded that the covenant that was made way back in Genesis in the Garden of Eden was a covenant made to all people. We may further be reminded that although the Lord narrowed the line of fulfillment of that covenant, his covenant never changed. And we may be reminded that his covenant with Israel was not a new or second or different covenant, but simply a covenant of the line of fulfillment. It's this covenant issue that drives the heterodox teachings of millennialism as well as the politics of the Middle East in our world today, but that's not for a sermon. Perhaps we can talk about that Bible class. This morning, however, as I told the children, we're fast forwarding some 30 years into the future to celebrate the baptism of the Lord. <coughs> Jesus' baptism was important because, although, uh, because through his baptism, he was ordained into his earthly ministry. He was, uh, he identified with us, and this was the beginning of his earthly work. Our text, the Old Testament lesson today, takes us back to the beginning and reminds us that this Christ who was baptized is God who created the world out of nothing. Indeed, in our text, we see the Trinity of God way back in the beginning, in Genesis, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Notice how we are told that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Indeed, the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. What you do not notice in your English translation is that the word God is in the plural. And no, this does not mean that we are polytheistic, that is, that we worship many gods, but rather that we worship a God, one God, who shows himself to be a plurality of God, that is, he is three persons in one Godhead, as we humanly describe him. In Genesis chapter 2, in speaking of himself, God says, let us, let us make man in our own image. It's another example of the plurality of God. In Deuteronomy, the Lord tells us that although he is a plurality, he is one. We hear this in what's called the great Shema, which means hear. That passage that says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Indeed, in this statement, the word God is also in the plural. So, God in the plural states that he is one. What we are seeing in Genesis is what we are shown throughout the word of God. That God is a triune, three in one God. What we see is also the fact that the trinity of God, of the Godhead, is never separate. God is always God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
As we celebrate the baptism of Jesus this morning, we also celebrate the fact that Jesus was also with the Father and the Holy Spirit at the creation of the world. Indeed, to deny the Trinity of God is to deny the very essence of God and brings judgment. But moving on in our text, we see the power of God and the power of his word. Verse 3. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Contrary to the evolutionist belief and the religion of Darwinism, all things did not simply come into being by themselves. As a matter of fact, no one has ever observed anything spontaneously appearing out of nothing. There's no evidence of this assertion. However, there is the fact that God tells us what happened at the creation of the world. And since he was there, we know we can trust his word. God tells us what happened at the creation of the world. That is, that God spoke, and it happened exactly as he said. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God tells us that he created light and he separated it from the darkness. These words remind us that before God created anything, there was only darkness and void, or as some translations put it, chaos. First thing that God created and called into existence was light. Perhaps light was the first thing God created because light is necessary for life. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus is often called the light of the world. And no, that doesn't mean that God created Jesus. Rather, that is a fitting title, because if light is necessary for life, Jesus, the light of the world, is indeed necessary for eternal life. Moving on in our text, we have God giving us the framework of time. The fra this framework of time often brings the question of what is meant by the word day. Verse 5. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. I find it quite interesting that although the sun was not created until the fourth day, that God gives us the framework of a day on the first day. So when God created the sun on the fourth day, he placed the sun and the revolution of the earth into the predetermined time frame he had already created on day one. So as for the question of what is a day, in the Bible, a day is always in reference to a 24-hour period of time. We talked about this before in Bible class, that all the times that a day is used in the Bible, the reference is a 24-hour period. A day is a day. <clears throat> Those who would propose otherwise, I might suggest, are kind of like Satan speaking to Adam and Eve in the garden. Did God really say did God really mean a day is a day? And most certainly that's what he said, and most certainly that's what he means. Now just as a brief aside, let me encourage you in your faith and in your trust in God's word. Although so-called human earthly scientists would like to theorize and even suggest that it is a fact that the world is millions and billions of years old and it came into existence, by millions and billions of accidental mutations, which always seem to make things better. And even though they would present so-called evidence for these natings, understand they were not there. They never observed what they are suggesting has happened, and their methods of dating are often unreliable. Again, as you've heard me say in Bible class, there are more reliable methods for dating and the most reliable method, methods for dating date the Earth as a young Earth. But since this doesn't fit the paradigm of the evolutionists, that's not what we're publicly given. But God was there. He saw how he created all things out of nothing. And he tells us how he accomplished creation. The Bible traces the age of the Earth through the genealogies. That's why we have so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. So that we can figure out about how old the Earth is. And we can believe and trust God and his word. Contrary to the wisdom of the world, which is often seen as foolishness, God's wisdom is seen in creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Just look at the complexity of the human body. 
look at the complexity of the world in which we live. We need a world which literally takes care of itself within the always ever-present preserving hand of its maker. So what does this mean, say, or suggest to us today? First and foremost, I would suggest it means that we know and understand that God's word is true and it can be trusted. We need this reminder and encouragement quite often because we are constantly in doubt and unbelief. Now, not that this is necessary for our faith, but all the findings of archaeologists over the years, none have ever disproven what we read in God's Word. As a matter of fact, very often they confirm the Word of God. Likewise, the creationists, and that's the name given for those scientists who actually believe the Bible and the fact that God created the world, and so they use the Bible as a starting point in helping to unlock and explain the world. When, when creationists look at the evidence, which is the same evidence that the evolutionists have, and remember, evidence doesn't speak. Evidence has to be interpreted. When the creationists look at this evidence, the explanation of the creationists is often more consistent and more logical than that of the evolutionists, who often must change and continue to change their explanations as more and more discoveries are found. So we should admit, to deny the word of God in Genesis as trustworthy and true is to deny God's word as trustworthy and true. Indeed, if God lied to us in Genesis, what is to say that he did not lie to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? This is indeed a foundational issue, for we can either believe God and his word, or the word of fallen, simple human reasoning. And here again, I would suggest that this is somewhat the same thing Luther was fighting uh, for the authority of the word of God in his day. God's word is true. <laughs> Thus God does not lie. When God speaks to us, we can believe him because he is God and he speaks truth. Even Jesus says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is God, Jesus is truth, and God is truth. Not only is God's word truth, God's word does what it says. There is a distinct difference between the Bible and all the other books in the world. God's word does what it says. When God's word speaks, it happens just as he speaks. We see this in our text this morning. In the beginning, God spoke all things into being. We saw God's word doing what it says this morning when we confessed our sins. And we heard the words, your sins are forgiven. We know that that's exactly what happened. Our sins were forgiven. We see this happen, and we'll see this happen as we come to the Lord's table and are given his body and blood to eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins. We bear witness of this every time we see a baptism in how God creates faith. We see this happen in our lives when we read and hear God's word, and his word has his way with us. God's word has power. Unlike all the other books in the world, God's word is a word of power, power to do what it says. An ordinary book, you can read for information. Certainly you may be moved emotionally. But no book except God's Word has the power to do anything. God's Word is a word of power, power to do what it says. And again, we saw this power this morning in our Old Testament lesson, in our text, when God said, let there be, and there was. That's the most important, is the fact that God's Word gives gifts. We see this especially in our epistle lesson and in our gospel lesson for this morning. Through the very means of grace, that is through God's word, through the holy baptism, which is water connected with God's word, through the Lord's Supper, which is bread and wine connected with God's word, through confession and absolution, which is God's word, God does great things and gives great gifts, faith, forgiveness of sins, life, salvation, eternal life. And in all these things, it is God who is active, and we who are passive. When it comes to our salvation, when it comes to good theology, remember that God is the one who is always doing, and we are the ones who are being done to. God gives, and we are given to. Perhaps you've heard the adage, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I believe that adage adds a bit too much baggage and gives me too much credit. Why should I impose myself on what God can or cannot do? Of course, we do so because of our nature. If we have a heart 
time leaning off the earth grace. But the fact of the matter is, God said it, and that settles it, whether I believe it or not, whether I try to get in the way of it or not. Indeed, God does what he does because he is God, and he can do what he wants to do. God does, God gives, because he is God. We are done to it, we are given to because of our need for him to give to us. And to that we say thanks be to God. Indeed, to him be the glory for Jesus' sake. Amen. And may the peace of God pass all in your family, keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus, the life of the last year. Amen. Having heard the word of the Lord, we respond to that word by confessing our faith. This morning, we do so with the word of the Nicene Creed, as Christ on page 174. Please God. morning, in our prayers, along with the prayers in the bulletin, we include prayers for Emily Sylvester, our friend Christina, uh, cousin Christina Cross, who is pregnant with twins, prayers for Bob Turner, who is having back pains, our prayers of thanks for Dan and Beth uh, Satan for successful surgery, prayers for uh, Satan's friend, uh, Debbie Frederick, who is in ICU with flu and asthma. Prayers for Alma uh, Cosart uh, and her family for difficult times, uh, Lawrence and Tessa's granddaughter, daughter and granddaughter. Uh, and prayers for the Hildebrandt family at the passing of uh, Jewel Hildebrandt. This morning I will pray, let us pray to the Lord and ask that you respond to the Lord have mercy. For the baptism that united us with Christ in his death, we may daily die to sin and rise with him. Set free from the meaning of sin and death, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the nation of the world still in darkness, that the Spirit would bring in light and light through the preaching of the gospel and call them to the waters of the new creation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who serve in the office of ministry, that all their preaching and teaching may faithfully point to the mightier one with zeal, as did St. John the Baptist, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for all who make minister and judge the laws of our land, that they can give wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to God's good will, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all children and youth, gracious Father, we pray, especially those who need family and home. We pray that you set your angels over them and provide them for the apparent safety, security, lavish exposure to your means of grace. We pray especially that according to your gracious will, Allie may return home soon. Let us pray for the allows your family that you grant strength to faith in Christ. Then we bear one of this burden and need peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for healthy children, gracious Father, we pray for Emily, Ashley, Rachel, Marcy, and Amber. For safety for those in the military, Logan, Caleb, Brittany, Jordan, and Derek. For those with special needs, we pray, Loving Father, for Debbie, Garrett, Jordan, Ron, and Barry. That you keep them steadfast in trouble and comfort them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. 
For the lonely and homebound, greedy and dying, especially the old grand families. For those who are afflicted in body, mind, and spirit, especially for Iona and her family, uh, Debbie, Bob, uh, Dan, Lewis, Beth, Kendra, Florence, Maria, Cody, Kelly, Janet, Debbie, Gail, Megan, Cordette, Catherine, Tim, Royal, Mickey, Dave, Paula, Corey, Shannon, Larry, Dan, Bobby, Gary, Eileen, Pat, Barbara, Dalton, Debbie, Cameron, Mary, Judy, Guy, Matthew, Charlie, Alice, Henry, David, Bobby, Maria, Marion, Janet, Karen, and all those who now name their hearts before you. Christ should be their companion in solitude, their comfort and sorrow, their health and sickness, and their life and death. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For all who will for today partake today in the Holy Eucharist, that they may be given grace to approach the altar with humility and faith, and so be strengthened by the Savior's body and blood to live as children of the day. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the faithfully departed who rest now in Christ, let us give God our thanks and praise and ask him to grant us our portion with the saints in life on the joyous day of Christ's appearing. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Mary the Lord, we can all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May we see it. This time we gather our first group size and offerings as the offering baskets are being passed around. You should find the record of fellowship book on the inside of the pew. Uh, please register your things and pass the book down. Thank you all.
your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your time. In him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name. Heaven will praise you in saying,
God that you have refreshed us through this our gift. And we pray that of your mercy you strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in perfect love for one another. In Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you. Keep you the Lord and make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you, the Lord. Look upon your favor 